mental and emotional health. Close to one billion people with depression and anxiety worldwide prior to COVID, and the numbers massively rising. Interpersonal conflicts in our families and in communities, and students in school at home. These are th three of the top challenges currently reported around the world, and yet this year has been an extraordinary gift. It has clearly identified needs, demonstrating how current traditional forms of education have been missing some vitally important things. Things that not just children, but all humans need, not just to survive, but to flourish, regardless of what situations occur. Online searches on coping in crisis are in constant demand, and leading health and education institutions share many recommendations in common. Many go beyond coping to flourishing. In positive psychology, this refers to the ultimate human desire to be happy, to have a life worth living. The Greek word eudaimonia describes it as a sense of wellness, of feeling blessed. And what it looks like is having loving relationships, uh, being able to cultivate positive emotions like hope, appreciation for beauty and nature, engaging in pleasurable but challenging activities. It's called being in a state of flow and finding a sense of meaning and purpose through serving something bigger than ourselves. Now, every time a crisis hits, people scramble looking for ways to cope, not having practiced what we need to deal with uncertainty. But I hope to show that through practice, so much more is possible, even in the face of crisis, because life will inevitably continue to present unpredictable challenges again and again. So we want to be ready to flourish over and over. Think about how much more agile we could be with the skills we need emotional and social intelligence, movement, and creative thinking. Just look what we instinctively went for. The top purchases during the pandemic included social connection platforms like Zoom that went from 10 million to hundreds of millions in months. Meditation app uploads rose 10 million a month. Exercise sales equipment, 600%. And this went then to creative arts, performance, art supplies, and games. We organically, intuitively knew how creativity helps. Just look at this dancer performing for his neighbors and being filmed. And we went from filming balcony concerts like this to online global dance parties and museums holding challenges for people to recreate famous works of art. All this shows is that we know what helps. So why does it take a global pandemic to get us thinking and behaving differently? Well, how much time do students spend in school practicing social emotional learning, movement, and creative arts? For that matter, how much time did we as adults spend doing that prior to the pandemic? Not much. And the truth is, anything we don't value in the adult world doesn't make it into schools. If the professional world valued it, it would be in schools tomorrow, just like subjects considered related to success in business. And we practice business skills so we can use those without thinking, just like we practice fire drills, so that we can use those in an emergency and respond. And so whether it's multiplication tables, or scales of a musical instrument, or the skills we need to manage anxiety, with something as simple as practice and repetition, we can more easily adapt because when we're stressed or in doubt, we're going to go to the thing we practice, not something new. And these are skills we can use every day, with or without a crisis. Emotional and social intelligence. What this comes down to is understanding and managing our emotions and our responses, communicating with compassion and empathy, the ability to handle conflicts constructively, which helps us make better decisions. And this is known to help reduce stress and increase well-being. In schools, it's referred to as social-emotional learning. And it's most often considered extra, enrichment, nice, but not essential. Not necessary to be college or career ready. And this is not surprising, given that in the professional world, even though we say we value it, it's referred to as soft skills. Nice, but not essential. According to the World Economic Forum, 
the leading barrier to programming in schools and in business is a supposed lack of evidence on the benefits, buy-in for that because of a lack of evidence. But think about the economic toll alone of a world suffering from a pandemic of depression and anxiety. According to the UN, prior to the current health crisis, the estimated cost to the global economy was a trillion dollars a year. And just think about the benefits of a society with more emotional flexibility and empathy and hope and optimism. And these can be practiced just like a dancer practices plies or a basketball pl uh, player shoots hoops. We start with the most basic thing, getting still and asking ourselves, how do I feel right now? This builds physical and psychological awareness of our feelings. Stop, take a breath, and notice. I feel like my head is going to explode or my stomach is tied in knots. Maybe I'm just worried about next week. I think I'm going to go take a walk around the block. And then after we deal with us, we can deal with others. Listening skills. And not just how to listen to others, but how to be listened to. We start by allowing others to share their thoughts without interrupting and asking questions for clarification or paraphrasing if we need. And since the majority of communication happens on a nonverbal level, paying attention to tone and body language and actions is pretty valuable, especially right now with virtual communication or not being able to see all of someone's face. I, I think I heard you say this. Is that what you meant? And that's the first step in handling conflict. Do you want to explain first and then I'll explain after? So wherever education takes place right now, the earlier and more often we have opportunities to practice, the greater our potential is to reap the benefits. And we can all learn together, just like we did in the school where we taught fourth graders how to have conversations about conflict, and they asked if we could teach it to their families on conference night. So as a mother, an educator, a business owner, and a futurist. I believe we can build in opportunities every day in schools and out for children and adults that would increase our chances to have a much better world. Movement. It's no news flash. Physical exercise is known to be a major contributor to mental well-being. It's known to help reduce and regulate strong emotions like depression and anxiety and increase and boost executive functions we need for learning like attention and memory. The recommendation is for an hour a day, yet the average amount of physical education in U.S. schools is an hour and a half a week. Now, this is not just a U.S. problem or a kid problem. According to the World Health Organization, Insufficient physical exercise is one of the leading risk factors for illness and death worldwide. And think about how much time, how much more time we've all spent sitting over the past several months. But there is good news. New data shows that an hour of even moderate physical activity can help counter the effects of too much sitting. And we can start small and do it anywhere. Schools, home, work, get up every hour and move around. Three yoga poses, a walk around the block or down the hall. Dance to one song, step outside and stretch your arms to the sky. Or maybe just walk over to the window and water the plants. And finally, creative thinking. In this past year, we have seen every sector of life go through a tsunami of change. Schools, families, communities around the world forced to adapt overnight. Who hasn't had to be creative recently? I mean, we've seen kids come up with innovative ways just to hug their grandparents through a shower curtain. I have worked with thousands of educators in hundreds of schools who say they want more creative arts education but feel tied to focusing on academics. Even in kindergarten, five-year-olds trading in imaginative arts and play for skill and drill math and reading exercises and nightly homework. Again, attributed to a supposed lack of evidence, this time on the benefits of arts education, which is very often viewed as a form of play. But there is lots of evidence. For example, in one 12-year study of 25,000 students, 
it was reported that adults who participated in arts had better outcomes on academics. College attendance, employment, relationships, civic and religious participation, and volunteerism. In other words, flourishing. It doesn't make any sense to cut out play. That doesn't make anyone more career ready. Just look at how many top high performance experts teach play to executives to increase joy and productivity and innovation. Not to mention how it fosters our humanity. Every human being is creative. And we don't have to be artists, but artists do know that taking advantage of opportunities to not know is one of the keys to creativity. It helps us learn how to think versus what to think. It encourages us to explore. It makes us ready, more ready to be uncertain, to make mistakes, discover by accident. It is the essence of learning and at the core of innovation. And it can even help with that search for purpose and meaning. We can start by drawing, writing, making something, anything without an intended outcome, and asking questions. What if? What don't I know about this? That's what every major inventor in history has done. What could be a more impossible or fun or useful way to do this? And by cultivating our creativity, we're better able to design intelligent machines for the future, equipping them to handle challenges with greater consideration for what helps humans flourish. Now, this past year has been tough. And yet, dealing with um, challenges, adapting, and facing crisis is not new to me. Decades ago, moving to New York City to go to college, I was faced with many unknowns, including watching many of my young friends die tragically to AIDS. Then, a mysterious disease, not unlike today, adapting meant dressing in full PPE, to take care of the people that we loved. Years later, the experience of living near the World Trade Towers meant dealing with tidal waves of emotions that came with the destruction, chaos, loss, and shock. And at the beginning of this pandemic, in the beginning, listening to nonstop ambulance sirens and walking on the street past morgue refrigeration trucks housing thousands of corpses, all the while, like so many people around the world, living in isolation, facing a steady stream of unknowns and in the continuing heartbreak of social injustices. Each crisis has required emotional, social, physical, and creative skills to cope and then to flourish. And this choice to flourish is how I hope to model living as a parent. And as an adult, parent or not, what we model affects and guides everyone around us. <laughs> now, I'd like to note, no one gets a certificate of completion in flourishing. As life shifts, so do our responses. And no one is immune from falling down or falling apart. I'm quite familiar with it. As my daughter would tell you, I have a lot of practicing to do. But that's part of life. And the learning and the practicing is a lifelong thing. Education never stops. And every location can become a place of education. We just have to think of it like fire drills, just like we practice stop, drop, and roll, or the alphabet song. Stop and breathe. Stop and feel, stop and listen, move, imagine, play. We can all transform education today, practicing the skills we need for an uncertain world, lives worth living, no matter what the future brings. Stop and breathe, stop and feel, stop and listen, move, imagine, play. Stop and breathe, stop and feel, stop and listen, move, imagine, play. Thank you.